Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, that's the first time I'm speaking uh, here in a big conference room like that. And usually I do prefer people, cr uh, you know, crowded uh, in the corridors, laying on the floor, uh, fighting for the space. Here I think we won't face this issue. So thank you, Grzegorz, because he uh, uh, did it because of you. Uh, usually uh, you uh, expected uh, to have the space. So today um, I will talk about awesomeness. Uh, it's good actually that I didn't need to use Polish equivalent uh, because it would be a, probably a dirt word. Um, so let me uh, tell you uh, the perspective here. So I myself started uh, playing with the software when I was six years old. So that's 35 years ago or more. Uh, and uh, for many years I've been you know, into technologies uh, as a developer, as a project manager, uh, leader, and uh, more than 10 years ago, I co-founded the company. Nowadays, it's more than 150 people, so not a small uh, thing anymore. And I must admit, about five years ago, I practically stopped coding, uh, like in the nights, maybe, or during hackathons. But uh, I cannot call myself anymore a developer by profession. And uh, I now, with the changing perspective, I see uh, how big the... Uh, the gap is between the business or the bosses working in the business space who decide about your salaries, about your success, and uh, engineers themselves. So I thought that before I forgot, and I will be become one more boss who doesn't care about engineers, hopefully it will never happen, but who knows. Uh, you know, life is brutal. Uh, I would like to share with you this perspective so both sides can uh, be closer and uh, be more effective. So uh, probably you may know me from uh, quite some famous or infamous presentations for the last several years. Some of them had uh, gathered thousands or tens of thousands of uh, uh, views. Still, this is a continuation showing how I uh, evolve and my thoughts uh, evolve. So let's quickly uh, start with decomposing the subject of this uh, talk, which is quite a long one. So we have three main pieces there. Modern uh, software development I mean, awesomeness is obvious, but we have a modern software development company. I would like to define it quickly, boss and customer, and finally impress. So let me quickly decompose it. So for me, a modern software development company is a company operating really in a highly competitive environment. Fast changing, reacting to feedback, building feedback loops, uh, constantly improving. Usually it's done, I mean, this is the only way w w which I can see in 21st century, by creating uh, autonomous teams, uh, fully empowered, be, uh, leveraging uh, mm, creative people uh, who may have individual, uh, great individual impact, uh, decentralizing uh, decision-making processes and responsibilities, and uh, applying lightweight processes. So note that I haven't said here a word about any technology, including Java. By the way, probably Java has been, is going to be used only once, here or twice, I've had, I have just done it. Uh, so don't expect any more this word here. Uh, it can be PHP, like uh, Facebook did. It could be you know uh, Ruby, uh, Java and Scala, like Twitter, whatever. Really, technology doesn't matter if these things matter. Then um, about the boss and uh, and the c how these companies look in practice. So in old world, uh, which is current world for many of us still, uh, we had usually multi uh, multiple layers of uh, teams or people. Uh, shielding us or protecting us from users or customers. We had a team uh, that was, you know, me here, that was our boss, maybe a, a team lead. Uh, there were various uh, representatives of the company talking closer to the customers, like key account managers, sales folks, uh, support folks, uh, product owners, and so on. Usually some customer representative who was shielding, in fact, users. And in this situation, boss was channeled all the communication and was distributing the information uh, accordingly. However, in new world, where fast feedback loops are necessary to react and adapt, we are in a more like a complete graph setup where everyone speaks to everyone. And so suddenly, myself uh, is uh, very close to uh, customer, to the users, to the reps, to, uh, uh, to the customer representatives, to our uh, people who are dealing with customers. We have everyone talking to everyone. And suddenly, then, there is not much difference between the boss and the customer. And actually, 
it's not the boss who pays our bill, our salary, but the customer actually. So it's not that bad to listen to customer as uh, as uh, s uh, strongly as to listen to your boss. Um, so by this, uh, I just cheated on you and uh, really uh, decided that boss equals customer, so I will concentrate just on one. Um, and impress. Impress is not about liking someone, personal taste, uh, you know, doing some tricks, jokes. It's about the output. And in the modern um, software companies, uh, impressing means constantly deliver greater and greater stuff. The stuff is usually a high quality product or service. Okay, so what I'm not talking about here is about, uh, for me, a modern software development company is not the company which just uh, uses people, engineers, or whoever it is, as kind of uh, batteries, uh, like in Matrix, to, you know, to run the company without their full involvement and full responsibility. So if you are in this company, maybe you won't understand what I'm talking about, but uh, I'm assuming uh, you are not. And for me, people are never resources. Resources are easily replica replicated, can be multiplied, can be scaled by duplicating them. People cannot be scaled in this way. And that's the whole fun for me as a boss. Okay, uh, so now we have these modern organizations which want to address the, uh, the uh, super fast uh, changing environment by um, creating this uh, full set of communication uh, channels. The problem is that it doesn't scale really. Uh, those of you who know graph theory, number of edges in the complete graph is proportional to the quadru like growth qu quadrat quadratically. Uh, and very quickly, with 10, 20, 30 people talking to each to everyone, it, does, it becomes a mess. No one knows what's going on. So this was faced by many companies, including ours. Uh, even with the size of 150, we do have this issue. Um, smarter guys than myself, uh, so uh, s former Google CEO, and executive chairman, uh, Eric Schmidt, uh, said that uh, smart creatives, the term coined by him and, uh, and popularized in the book, How Google Works, by the way, I highly recommend reading this book, it's about the empowerment, about culture, about hiring as well, so very good book. Uh, so a few years ago, he coined this term smart creatives, and for him, these were the pillars to allow uh, company scale without f facing these messiness issues. Why? because it uh, allows partitioning of the company into smaller parallel streams without very little uh, coupling. So very similar to what we are facing in, say, microservice architectures or uh, scalable systems when we are looking for the way how to scale uh, our system by partitioning. And suddenly the same problems, the same scaling issues apply to companies as well. But even they are magnified, because with the computer, communication can be super fast. It can be you know, nanoseconds or milliseconds to request, uh, send request, process, response, and act. Well, for people, anyone involved in the communication channels, it's measured at least in minutes, if not in hours or days, especially if you are uh, facing any ge geographical uh, differences, uh, time zone differences. Uh, so uh, for Eric Schmidt, uh, and Jonathan Rosenberg, by the way, uh, was a senior vice president of the product uh, development at Google. Um, these uh, smart creatives were the next generation of knowledge worker. A knowledge worker is an old term from, I think, 60s, introduced by uh, uh, the famous writer uh, Peter Drucker, who defined uh, in, the in the Industrial Revolution that a, that a knowledge worker is the next step from a factory into a person who works mostly with their minds, not hands and uh, follows rigid processes and so on. So smart creative is not a knowledge worker, it's the next uh, uh, stage of knowledge worker. And let's quickly look at who smart creative is or what traits she or he has. So tons of traits. I would say it's almost like an ungodly creature uh, from uh, being a person hands-on with deep technical knowledge, very detailed, uh, great in communication, creative, funny, or even charismatic, uh, business savvy, so really good at understanding the business, uh, at the same time bored easily and shifting jobs a lot, so uh, that may ring a bell. Uh, analytically smart, obviously passionate, smart about the users, so he uh, himself represents a user, he understands full users, he's like a power user, he's often part of the community of users. Uh, he has a lot of initiative, he doesn't uh, require direction, giving direction, he's self-directed. He's not afraid of taking risks, he's curious, uh, and he's able and willing to fiercely disagree uh, with anyone, including the person who is uh, who's in power to fire or promote someone. Uh, he's fully open. And then we have uh, 
two things which are environmental here. So this person thrives or requires uh, a not confined environment. So the task, role, given job title, given org structure, or concrete working hours doesn't matter for this person. And this person doesn't like to be limited to access uh, to any information or resources in the company, like for example, computing resources or access to some systems. Um, in fact, but in, in return, he's open or she's open. Uh, she doesn't uh, confine any access to anyone from the information or outcome of the uh, work this person does. And uh, this person is full of creative energy and multidimensional means like thinking uh, not just about, say, technology, but you know, on many aspects. And this is, these were the traits specified by uh, Google folks in the book itself, so that's a lot. Um, and according to them, not every one of them are necessary, but this in bold font are definitely a must-haves, and without them, there is no chance a person can be a smart creative. And note that hands-on and deep technical knowledge are here, so it's not about you know, being a boss who knows how to just manage or delegate, it's about really being able to uh, get hands dirty, pull, out, pull up sleeves, and do the work with full understanding what it means. Okay, so... Uh, it looks like these uh, creatures are like unicorns. So it's a theory. Uh, can we find such people or do, do such people exist? And in fact, uh, there is strong belief, and I, I mean, I, I know it, I, I have such people in my company, that smart creatives are everywhere. And uh, actually, it's even better because the world we are living in, the world which quickly changes, uh, the world where the uh, societies become less and less rigid, we have more and more, uh, ac more open access to information, uh, to education, uh, we, there are fewer sacred cows we cannot challenge, we have less borders, limitations, and more uh, easier direct feedback loops, for example, from our users, from customers, thanks to internet, then this environment lets uh, smart creatives thrive and grow. And uh, the, the more such situation we have, the more cre uh, smart creatives arrive. I mean, are not, it's not, people are not born, they, are, they become, in such environment, smart creatives. If they have some uh, good traits, and I will be talking about these traits. So let's quickly take a look at what drives uh, smart creatives. Number one, things are about learning new things. It's about uh, uh, achieving some important things which do matter. It's about solving some problems, uh, interesting problems, ideally, and having an interesting general life where, uh, and, and having interesting people around, because it also makes like this person Wants, is interesting by themselves, is creative, is full of energy, and the environment, interesting environment, uh, lets this person uh, be even more creative. Uh, what doesn't drive, really? Compensation only. Compensation comes second. Uh, these people don't bother about company mission or vision. That's for them. doesn't really matter. Uh, stability, like really uh, focusing on whether I can work in a given company or a team for years, doesn't really matter. And perks like, you know, extra a car or maybe a educational, uh, like the uh, English lessons or whatever it is, a conference, it's uh, a minor thing. I mean, obviously, it's okay, but uh, it never is a focus of their attention. So let's take a look at uh, what the data says now. Uh, this was what uh, the book says, and now let's take a look at what uh, data says. Uh, so Hacker Rank published just a couple of weeks ago an interesting report about uh, who... Uh, about people who use the site, and this is the site used for solving online uh, coding tests, for example, or various competitions, and many companies use it, for example, to process uh, candidates in early stages. Mm, so HackerRank shared it publicly, and about 40,000 people, I mean, all of them were developers or knew how to uh, deal with the programming, answered what for them is most important when they are looking for a new job. And as you can see, Compensation here comes on the third place, really. But let's say first six elements are pretty much uh, similar, similarly important, with uh, company mission being very, very high to the bottom. Perks, uh, valuation, stability, doesn't really matter. What matters are things like growth, learning, uh, smart people uh, and team around. That's also important, I will, it, and it really contributes to learning. Interesting problems to solve, compensation is necessary, obviously, and good work-life balance, which is uh, also a very interesting thing. Um, I will quickly uh, cover that in a sec. Um, in Poland, this, is, this was for the 40,000 people from across the world. In Poland, it looks quite different. 
but not that much. So the first five are pretty much still the first five. Note that in Poland, compensation somehow uh, is less important. I haven't seen that as a boss in our company, but uh, yes. Uh, maybe people are afraid of uh, openly, openly admitting that. But definitely what is even more important is smart people, interesting problems to solve, good work life balance are, is still here is number second, and professional growth and learning. So super important things. Uh, in Poland, uh, company mission is even less important, and I guess it's because as a former communist country where for years we are accustomed to hearing bullshit, uh, we treat this stuff as bullshit, and we are pretty much uh, bullshit uh, proof, uh, so it, it doesn't matter. Uh, also, also, in a lot of companies, really, whatever they, p uh, they, they put in uh, uh, writing, people don't care in the, on a daily basis. It uh, doesn't impact their job, so it really doesn't matter. Then the concrete projects, uh, the concrete uh, challenge the given person responsible for. Um, we focus on the balance. Uh, note there is a difference here, very high. I mean, number one in Poland, uh, less important, really. And I learned as a person who hires uh, people from 14 right now countries, uh, that uh, we are quite happy in Poland because the majority of us can enjoy 40 or 40 uh, uh, hours per uh, week uh, um, uh, work week. Whereas in many countries, especially in India, that's not the case. People offer, often work their 70, 80 hours per uh, year. Holidays in States, for example, are you know, not granted. Uh, it's a perk that you can have a day off, and usually it's a perk which is optional, so you are given day off, but if you take them, that uh, may, may not necessarily be uh, seen as the, the great thing. In Poland, it's not that bad, uh, so because uh, whole results were obviously uh, skewed or biased by uh, people from other countries, that, that's for sure where go, go, uh, good work life balance uh, uh, came so high. Also, uh, nice, interesting thing, if you look at the distribution uh, between younger folks, so-called millennials, it's where, uh, for these folks, uh, ideally job becomes their hobby. I mean, that's the, the best thing. And in this case, work life balance means often working on a job which is your hobby, and then you are, have one, I mean, everything you spend in your job is great work life balance. So that's, that's also great. Uh, okay, so that was the stats. Apparently in Poland and in the world, uh, there is a desire for learning, there is a desire for uh, bigger impact, uh, for the growth. So how we can find such people if you are looking for them, or how we can become a smart creative, maybe we are already. Um, and here I will quickly share with you a couple of slides in green. I will be uh, showing some questions which uh, at Spartus, uh, we are using to at uh, the various interviews, usually at the later stages, uh, trying to probe if people have these traits. And uh, I, I'm not afraid uh, of sharing these questions with you, even if some of you may, you know, in the future apply to Spartus, because it's not about knowing the question really, it's, not, it's about understanding the answer and uh, acting uh, according to the answer. So. Um, a few slides will follow uh, in the next 30 minutes, a uh, couple of them with the questions, uh, trying to address uh, how to find such people. Okay, let's go back to the traits. So there are several key traits which allow or which cause forming of a smart creative. Let me start with the first one. Does anyone know what IJP or RBP mean? Which are TLA, so three-letter acronyms, you know, famous in the US, TLA, three-letter acronym. Anyone knows what? IHP or RBP stands for. So IHP is intellectual horsepower, so like, you know, in a car, very frequently used by Americans, Indians, and uh, in uh, Anglo-Saxon culture. RBP is a raw brain power. Similar the same, uh, one is probably more in automotive type of uh, thinking about the person, horsepower, and the other is about maybe more biological. Anyway, it's a number one thing which uh, uh, contributes to making one uh, smart creative. Uh, and now why? Uh, you've probably seen this chart many times. This is the history of the humankind, and this is where we are now. So for hun hundreds and thousands of years, we were advancing in a relatively, uh, with a slow acceleration. You know, from the uh, first uh, uh, achievement by uh, ancient Egyptians, Greeks, then the press, you know, Isaac Newton and so on, and 19th and 20th century, 
uh, this is where we become accelerating. And many, fut many futurists believe that we are almost facing out the wall. This is this hockey curve, and we are around only at the bottom of this hockey curve, and uh, we'll see the, the exponential growth. And with this exponential growth, intelligence is super important. Why? Because uh, high intelligence is, uh, according to the scientists, is the number one uh, a way to deal with exponential changes. With the linear changes, it's okay, inertia will help, but with an exponential changes, high level of intelligence is number one to deal with that and adapt. But this was, you know, this is more or less a bullshit someone draws, drew some person, you know, a wall. Look at, look at the data. Look at, uh, for example, famous Moore, Moore Law, uh, one of the founders of Intel, in practice and the processors. So from 70 to 2016, so without two last years, you can see, this is logarithmic scale, how, uh, how the growth uh, was going of the processors in terms of the number of uh, transistors. It's, it's only, you know, 36 years here. So less than I live. And from 2,000 uh, transistors to 20 billion transistors in 30 years, I will uh, show you in a moment what it really means. And I do remember uh, having a great processor called MOS 6502. Anyone knows what the processor was used there, where? Where this processor was used? Atari 65 and 130. It was uh, exactly 300, uh, 3,510 transistors. It used also, by the way, in Apple 1 and 2. Uh, not that long ago. Many of you remember that time. Then uh, another famous processor, Motorola 68000. Does anyone know? Amiga, exactly, Amiga. This was used in Amiga and Atari ST. Uh, by the way, anyone has any idea how many pro uh, transistors did this processor have? Any guesses? 68,000, exactly. The name was following uh, the number of processors, so it, was, it had exactly 68,000 processors, uh, transistors, sorry. And now this, uh, this goes exponentially very quickly. Let's look at what it means in practice. The same scale and put uh, really um, animals or human being here. So in 2000, we were not yet reaching the size of the uh, one insect brain. In uh, now we are we exceeded already or around to uh, animals like mouse. Soon, because the last 36 years, let us believe it does it won't stop. Soon we'll exceed the cap capability of uh, human brain, and uh, in 2060 of the all human brains together. That's scary for me. Uh, I don't know what to do with that, uh, honestly, uh, but I hope I will figure it out on the way. Um, so, going back to intellectual horsepower. So, it does matter a lot because some threshold has to be achieved to be successful. Uh, some of your stuff is, is conceivable only by a person with very, very high intelligence, like, you know, Einstein or... Uh, or uh, Hawking, uh, uh, raw intellectual power is a good starting point for any exponential thinker, a person who has to deal with exponential change. But also, it's very important, high intellectual horsepower may be dangerous. Why? Because it makes us lazy. It makes us lazy because uh, pretty uh, easily, with, as a person, teenager, or as a young uh, employee, for example, young professional, without much uh, without much effort, we can quickly achieve a lot, or at least has, have moderate success. Also, uh, I will always uh, repeat it when I'm in Poland, speaking in Poland, remember about it. And this is already proven by scientists, a neuro neurologi neurobiological scientist, that being negative, and in Poland, negative, being negative is part of the polls a lot of engineers apply. Just, you know, this is, this is sexy to be negative, to, to whine, to, to winch, to criticize, not constructively. And it was proven that uh, being negative about something is, uh, destroys your brain, brain and destroys, really, I mean, damages physically, damages in the long term the brain of people around you. So, uh, on the other hand, on the other side, positive emotions, uh, positive uh, influence, positive signals, are key uh, for learning and creative, creative thinking. Generally, being happy uh, broadens whole thought process and brings more of our capacity online. So that's, that, these are facts from the uh, last 20 years, 25 years. Uh, so in our case, it's like, you know, you can be a, 
a fly and see shit everywhere and complain, or you can be a bee and see flowers everywhere, or you can see, uh, perceive a, a glass half empty as a threat, or Jesus, it's ha the glass is already half empty, whereas a positive thinking of the same would be, wow, we can now do something and really we have opportunity to, f to fill it again. So again, uh, for me, whenever I'm talking to a Polish audience or Central European at least, because it's not only, only Polish scene, uh, that's the same applies for most of our Central European colleagues, uh, be more, be less about no and about bad. So less disagree, less uh, say always, but it doesn't work because or bad, but be more about yes and and to amplify what you are uh, talking about. Uh, generally more about the brain plastic plasticity, so how uh, neural um, cells can be connected while you get older, so it's not only when you are born, but when you get older. More about it in this great book by Andy Hunt. He's, by the way, the, an, an engineer who wrote in a very, very engineering, scientific way things he learned about the brain. Highly recommend this book. But I was talking to you about uh, an intelligence, and you may believe, hey, I need to be an Einstein or uh, you know, other genius to be a smart creative. Not, it's not for me. I'm not an Einstein, obviously. But honestly, the older I become, the more I believe, seeing the evidence that intelligence alone is overrated. Intelli only intelligence without any other things won't help you at all. It's definitely overrated. In fact, what I have learned painfully, uh, because I, I considered myself to be quite intelligent and talented uh, as a kid, and I suffered from the syndrome of being lazy, obviously, uh, that success is 10% of talent and 90% of the hard work. There is a nice uh, quote from, uh, actually popularized by Kevin Durant. I think you know him. He won uh, twice with his team uh, NBA in last year and this year as the best player. So he popularized the quote from his trainer, Tim Notke was his trainer in high school, that hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. Uh, so think about it, like talent is great, if both of them don't work, talent wins. But always, always hard work will beat talent if talent is not working. Let, I mean to tennis as a guy, let me prove it what it means in nowadays terms. Lukas Kubot, you probably know him. The guy who was number one in early 2018 after 20 years of being in tennis. I happen to have a t tennis trainer who used to play in the same uh, school, tennis school with Lukas. Uh, Lukas was then Kubot 22, 23 maybe. So every Teenagers at that time, 18 years old or 19 years old, after you know two, three hours of training, were having beers, were joking, and so on. Lukas was the guy who was taking notes, talking to the trainer, reviewing videos, and for 20 years was working on the improving himself. And guess what? He succeeded. It took him 20 years. He wasn't that talented like Roger Federer was, maybe, but ultimately by hard work uh, and working on his talent, uh, he succeeded. Which uh, moves us to the missing component, which I mentioned, that the intelligence alone is overrated. So intelligence with constant learning is then become crucial. So this is the other thing missing to the, in the puzzle. With, uh, with learning, it's great that uh, this actually helps you avoid aging, really. So Henry Ford, you probably know him from cars, manufacturing, and so on. He said really that this famous quote that the greatest thing in life is to keep your mind young. And many people, old people who are really active, who still learn, uh, are really brilliant and keep their mind young. Uh, and there is a new thing about learning, uh, which is making learning, putting learning to the next step. Uh, a few years ago, Carol Dweck, uh, in her book, uh, Mindset, the New Psychology of Success, coined the term growth mindset. And this is uh, another step, another, another step in uh, learning. So with fixed mindset, people with fixed mindset believe that they, are, they were born, they developed themselves into some stage, and it, it's fixed. Their capabilities are fixed, their boundaries are fixed, and they, were, they operate to maximize their performance with the, in the confined situation. People with growth mindset uh, believe, uh, and have uh, firm reasons to believe, they can alter uh, their, own their own qualities, their capabilities, really uh, biological capabilities of their brain, they can change oneself, they can adapt, and they move, the more they are forced to adapt by the environment, the better results are. And they are not that focused about concrete performance goals, they are, they are focused about learning goals, learning new things. So growth mindset is uh, 
really learning, which has permanent effect of oneself. It really does physically, as was proven, uh, has been proven ma ma many times by the scientists uh, really uh, examining uh, the brains, has permanent effects on oneself and permanently increases the capability of, of one person. Um, it's a great thing that agile environment, we are lucky to embrace first in the whole world as engineers, is super friendly for such uh, uh, setup. It's a super friendly, uh, friendly setup, for, uh, setup for growth mindset, for cultivating that. Uh, also, uh, growth mindset is a perfect stance together with intelligence in the exponentially changing world. And a uh, key thing here is openness. So without openness for feedback, learning is uh, not that useful really because only feedback from learning let us internalize the lessons learned really. And obviously the growth mindset requires flexibility and adaptability. And with person in this, uh, in this growth mindset, there is nothing like over being overqualified to do something. Why put these two images? That's a real story from an operator of a digger who once, a couple of years ago, was digging stuff in my uh, plot, on my plot of my garden, actually with this even digger. And uh, he was really fighting with uh, some small, a tiny hole because his, uh, his stuff was too big, really, to dig something smaller. And I proposed, hey, but you have a shovel. Just take a shovel, it's you know, 30, 30 seconds, you'll do it. And he said, I'm not authorized to operate a shovel. Uh, so that's uh, what I mean by being not hands-on person. You know, you, you say, I'm not authorized. Now it was a joke, but actually many cultures have this uh, thing in, uh, grained in their culture. We have a, an employee with whom I had a problem. Uh, he, was, he, he was a supporter, support engineer, and he faced multiple times customers asking about the same things which were not documented. And he could have documented it uh, in, our public, uh, pub, uh, in our public website facing customers, and by this, by this would uh, uh, lower the number of requests, really, and make the uh, life of the customers easier, but he did not. And I asked him why you haven't done it. Didn't you think about it? And he said, of course, I, I was thinking about it, but I'm not uh, authorized by my job description to change uh, public documentation. But I, 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 but I said, but you have access rights. Hey, I'm coming from Asia. There, they would fire me if I did it. Uh, I'm not really authorized. So there are cultures which environments where this is not that obvious, like for, us, for you because you joked, you laughed. Okay, more about the growth mindset. Uh, growth mindset is this kind of behavior where we, when we believe that uh, learning is our goal, not the uh, uh, performance itself, and the effort, working hard on it, makes me stronger, then uh, really we spend more and more time working hard on the goal, and the effect are higher achievements, really. Uh, so two things have to happen, really. First of all, we believe we can uh, uh, make ourselves stronger because of that, and we put extra time and effort. Uh, what it means in practice, really, uh, when you uh, apply some control groups, I mean, really, scientific approach, have a control group which was uh, given a uh, prize uh, of resilience. I mean, you had, sorry, two, had two groups. Uh, scientists did uh, a, change, uh, a test. Two groups, one group was priced for uh, high intelligence, just try one, one more time, so they tried, there was a failure, uh, they were priced for uh, intelligence, uh, try one more time, and the others were priced for a big effort. And the other group, guess what, was far more successful and they improved. So remember when you have kids or employees maybe, always remember that pricing for hard work, not for talent, is a way to go. Because talent, you know, is something uh, inborn. It's difficult to price someone because he's talented or she's talented. But if you price for working hard on improvement, that matters. So these were studies about kids. The question is, can it work for adults? And really, again, tennis example, Roger Federer, the guy, the best guy, the best player ever, uh, he was quite miserable with surf. Uh, and he was 33 or 4 when he learned finally how to surf. After 20, several, 30 years of playing game, so he has other adjustments to his game, really. I mean, obviously he's talented, but he can do that. And I know plenty of dev developers, for instance, who are 50 years uh, old or even older, who know uh, still how to adjust, how to learn new things. Okay, so a few ideas how to test learning habits, uh, how we do it at Spartus. So obviously, like a cliche question is like, what have you learned in your current job, for example, or what do you hope to learn? Uh, 
but this is uh, often a rising a brow of many candidates is uh, what do you do to stay up uh, today to be up to date with the new technologies what do you decide how do you decide what to learn and what to skip really uh, what and how you have uh, learned recently what did you learn last month and that's a question which often oh well, last month i didn't really learn anything what did you learn last week and that's a question which a couple of uh, executives in the US use. And the one, this one is used by Elon Musk. What have you learned today? Uh, if you don't, cannot answer, think about your learning habits. Uh, the growth, testing growing, uh, growth mindset is more difficult. Um, these are often a meta questions. It's like ab ab about, for example, this one. What big trends did you miss uh, in the recent past? Uh, wh what did you really... Uh, get right, what did you predict well and what did you didn't, uh, maybe what questions you have about this job, uh, what challenges you expect here, uh, and how do you plan to overcome them. Uh, and finally, how do you measure yourself, how do you know that you are getting better, otherwise if you don't have this feedback loop, you are blind. Uh, so uh, Lou Adler, uh, one of the best-selling author around hiring, says that good people always ask good questions. So for them at the interview, uh, letting people ask questions is often better than asking people uh, themselves. Uh, a note about senior engineers. So uh, for me, uh, over years, I uh, realized that being senior is most about impacting others, really, and growing others in your company. It's about, like, number one job is build the environment in the company, so together with younger, uh, less experienced people, uh, we can fail fast, we can learn, we set quick feedback loop. It's about, also the job is about teaching and mentoring others, and setting great example by constant learning and improving themselves, by themselves. So obviously, if a senior engineer just says you have to learn, but he doesn't or she doesn't learn, it's a failed example. And also, senior engineers should ask uh, their people around hard questions which trigger learning, and uh, what senior role is not about is definitely not about linear stuff. It's not about doing more or faster the same stuff. And this is not that obvious to many people. I recently interviewed a principal architect. Um, who's, I asked him, what makes you principal? That's also my favorite question. Or what makes, what makes you senior, in, uh, according to you? And he said, I do 45 issues per week. And I couldn't understand. Uh, could you repeat? Yeah, I have, we have Jira, and I'm given 45 issues per week, and I'm doing 45, I'm, I'm a pre, uh, chief architect. If I was doing 40, I would be just architect. 30 senior, 25 mid-level guy. And it, by the way, turned out that he is not, is not, not even able to run the system doing 45 tasks per week. But still, a lot, a lot of people are in this mindset. Uh, so how to uh, probe uh, learning and teaching? Uh, for example, one of the questions I've recently started asking, uh, what new could you teach me? And then, do it, you have three minutes. Teach me something new, it also shows, will show you your communication skills. Uh, also, how did you change the way you work in last, uh, recently, or in last one, two years? And then the follow-up questions. Uh, what do you now do differently, and now, and why? And finally, have you impacted people around? How they changed uh, uh, because of you? Next thing is experience, the next uh, important uh, factor which allows to uh, create smart creative. So some people believe that years of experience matter. I don't believe. I think that the quality of environment someone has been working in is far more important. So years of experience are less meaningful than the environment. For example, just imagine a player in the third league of Polish soccer versus Premiership League or a Spanish uh, league or a Bundesliga. Uh, it's a, people grow way, way faster uh, around uh, great people about them. Or take the Polish baseball league versus American baseball. Like the best Polish baseball player probably wouldn't even qualify to third league of baseball in America. Just the, the focus on the sport intensity is so higher. Uh, exper experience obviously in the right environment increases self-awareness and maturity. That helps and uh, maturity and self-awareness are necessary ingredients to become senior person, definitely. But also, uh, a lot of people remember, like forget, sorry, that uh, it's better to be really the worst person, less, uh, the, the, the least knowledgeable, the least mature person in a group than the strongest. Usually people uh, become, uh, like level up or become, uh, or follow the average often. So if you are the best, it's a chance that over time you will degrade, deteriorate as a person. If you are the weakest person is guaranteed that you will level up very quickly. 
Uh, actually, in uh, uh, sorry, uh, actually, one of the sayings we had in Polish that it's better to be the last person in the city than the first person in the village. It's not about, you know, villagers, I, have, I, I will live in the village by myself, but I mean about the opportunities you have and challenges you face in the city with thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of people versus a village of 20 people where being the best doesn't mean that much. Uh, so that's the conclusion, really, and I've seen it from many interviews, really, and uh, believe me, uh, over the last 10 years, we've interviewed... Uh, tens of thousands of people, or processed, at least interviews probably less than that, but still thousands of people. And I often seen that people coming from uh, fast-pacing environment, uh, environments are more often qualified, they're more, uh, they are uh, closer to the perfect uh, description of the perfect employee than a person with, say, 10 years or 20 years in a very slow-pacing environment, and not demand demanding. Okay, so how to test this experience or environment? I'm asking questions like, what is your top, top professional achievement? And why did you pick this achievement as the top? Uh, and a reflection. What would you do differently if you had been given a chance to go back in time and uh, adjust? Uh, or what is your top strength? And obviously, that's easy to answer, but tell me uh, the case when it showed, really, when this top strength was applied. And or describe, describe software development lifecycle uh, you found which works best for you. Uh, the best part is uh, what are the weakest points of this uh, software development lifecycle? And then how would you improve it? Have you really? Have you improved this uh, lifecycle? If not, then why? And a lot of people then stop. I was complaining. It sucked. I didn't do anything. And finally, what, are the, what was the biggest decision you have ever made? So the caliber of the decisions one could do or could make in their former job. And how did you approach it? The decision itself is one thing, but also how did you how, that, how did one approach it? Also, super important. Okay, the last but not least uh, part is responsibility. So, responsibility uh, for me means making sure that something, the problem, is solved completely. Just imagine you are responsible for your daughter, or uh, say five years old daughter, and just imagine you are responsible and you told your wife or a husband, I almost delivered her to pre preschool. I left her just, you know, one kilometer from preschool. I almost did it. It's not any responsibility. Responsibility is about uh, uh, attention to details, really, uh, and when details matter, and in our world, details matter a lot, uh, because half products, so a product which is almost ready, but misses, for example, installer, it's uh, of no use. If there is no installer, then when, when someone can easily install it, of no use. If someone cannot, like, we have everything, but you cannot log in, well, it's useless. Small detail makes the, uh, makes the uh, render the system irrelevant. And uh, generally, ownership, to give someone ownership for something requires this person to be fully responsible for that. And finally, if they are responsible, you can empower them. And empower, empowering autonomous people, autonomous team, was a key ingredient to scale your organization. Okay, now about the data, uh, and especially big data. And I've, I've seen people not very responsible about how they use data. So often people re uh, forget that uh, Data, uh, and nowadays with big data, we are mostly talking about statistics, really, uh, are the worst kind of lie if they are abused, really. And uh, a lot of people also believe that if they have data, if they gather data, they can, st can stop thinking and just let data decide. In fact, if uh, the data clearly tell you what the decision should be, it's already too late. I mean, decision is always about having some options. If it's obvious, it's not a decision. Uh, and probably if you are waiting for data to show you, for example, that you are out of the business, so you have revenue of zero last month, zero this month, you are out of the business. If you just act because data showed you you are out of the business, it's too late to make any decision. And also a lot of people forget about the data. Dealing with data is about the science, not about the art. And let me give you a few examples. Abusing the data. I've seen it many times with uh, people around in our company, in different companies. So just... You may be faced at the, some review, board review, of one of the uh, projects. We are, we, have, we have phenomenal growth. We have hockey curve. You know what, like last five months, great. If you look wider, it's a, in fact, the picture looks like this. Uh, we have the phenomenal uh, descent here, and just some local uh, hiccup, and then again, it's bad. So this is exactly the same numbers, but really where a person didn't care to look at the bigger picture. Or another, my uh, favorite one, 
That's like how customers are distributed. So we have, say, 50% renewing customers, 10% we lost as a churn, and 30% of the new. And I quickly say, how about the remaining 10? It, some, it adds up only to 90. We have 100. And uh, I didn't thought about it. How, ca how can one seriously treat such a uh, chart then? Or extrapolation. That's also a nice place. You know, yesterday, zero husbands. Today, one husband. You know, in 40 days, 40 husbands. That's great. Or this one, correlation versus causation. That's a, you know, Internet Explorer, market share, and that's a number of deaths. Seriously, like Internet Explorer, uh, the diminishing of IE helped US civilization, apparently, society. So a lot of people really are not able to uh, distinguish correlation and causation. And the difference is very important, but it's also tricky. It's tricky uh, because uh, you, sometimes you may not know. And I will give you an example. Uh, with Atlassian, we had this uh, situation where we saw from the data that non-English speaking countries uh, tend to renew uh, slower or at lower rate uh, pro Atlassian products like Jira or Confluence than English speaking countries. And one of the theory, like we look closely at the data, analyze it, one of the theory, hypothesis, was that maybe we miss, it's because we miss uh, localized uh, communication for these folks, like newsletters, reminders about renewal, uh, how to uh, release notes, and so on, in their own language, including Poland, by the way. I, I was skeptical. I had different theory. My theory was that non-English uh, countries in Europe are just poorer, uh, and they don't renew that actively. Uh, and we decided to validate that. We could have spent millions and, you know, validated uh, going big, but it's usually possible to validate such hypotheses, like set the hypothesis and validate them rather, relatively cheaply with an MVP, I would say like the minimum viable proof, uh, not a product, uh, to go light and see whether, say, just cover one language, cover for uh, three weeks uh, release notes in, say, Portuguese or Polish, and see whether it, it has an impact. It didn't, by the way. Uh, so uh, this uh, theory was... Um, abandoned. So please, please about the data. Data cannot replace thinking. I please, please remember about it. Use your brain. Use common sense. Uh, you know, if a rooster in the morning crows it do and the temperature grows, it doesn't mean that the rooster cr increases the temperature in the world. Right? That's not about it. And double check, cross check your data before making any conclusions. And before going big with your data, do this your data right. The last ingredient, we have three more minutes, is passion. Passion is an often abused word, P word, word. Often people uh, say how passionate they are about something, whereas in fact, really passionate people don't say about it anything, but they do. And it shows, it's obvious to everyone around that they are passionate about something. Uh, intrinsic motivation uh, drives passion way better than extrinsic motivation like, say, money or ti job titles or some you know, external goals. Curiosity is a great source of, uh, of passion and motivation. Desire to change anything, myself, the world, this uh, room here. And passion cannot be really overrated. It's, uh, when combined with intelligence, uh, high uh, intellectual horsepower with uh, learning uh, and responsibility, passion does amazing things. And also passion and motivations are in the interesting uh, spiral with achievements. So uh, when you are motivated and you achieve something, uh, then those achievements feed back, uh, loop back, and increase your motivation. Uh, and then you have even more uh, higher achievements. Really perks or uh, money here won't work that well as intrinsic motivation and achievements which motivates one best. So how to explore motivation? Hmm. These are some obvious questions like, why are you joining us? Or why do you want to change uh, your current job? So leave some company. Why do you at all pursue the uh, career of software developer? Or why do you want to learn some stuff? Or what are you passionate about and why? And the best follow-up question is, what have you done recently to cultivate this passion, really? So uh, I would like to try to finish with the formula for awesomeness. Uh, so this is A, awesomeness. Awesomeness is proportional uh, to intellectual horsepower. It's proportional to learning mindset. Uh, it's proportional to experience. The better, the more challenging exp experience, the better. It's obviously proportional to responsibility of one person and to the passion. 
I don't dare uh, decide whether it's a sum or a product of these factors, what are weights or even powers. I believe that passion here should be probably squared uh, in the formula, but your millet may, may vary. It's really difficult. But all these ingredients are super important. And guess what? There is no technical skills here because I realized that technical skills are the output, are the product of awesomeness and not the input. They, are, they, they, they don't cause the awesomeness to happen, but a person who, does, who has these traits gets skills, becomes super skill, skillful in all these areas. So this is byproduct, really. So a few takeaways and we are done. Uh, so uh, with exponential growth of the world of the technology, uh, that's for sure we see now more unknowns and knowns, and honestly, looking at the art how artificial intelligence go, how uh, ex space exploration go, and so on, na nanobiology, difficult to predict what happens. Uh, anyway, companies react uh, by relying an, uh, on individuals and empowering them to quickly adapt and scale their businesses, otherwise they are dead. Uh, vert vertical uh, uh, scaling of the organization has its limits. So o always when you build a hierarchy, the person on top becomes your bottleneck. And there is no chance uh, in a modern world that any the most genius person can handle uh, several things at the same time with an appropriate attention. And what Google did, for instance, a few years ago they created a, a mothership company, a conglomerate called Alphabet, probably you know it. And their whole idea was let's partition ourselves into totally independent groups where the, this conglomerate is just responsible for branding and providing you know, money to make the business running, whereas all the decisions, all of them, are fully decoupled and each of the business, like YouTube separately to Google, separately to Waze, separately to uh, God know what, some uh, pharmaceutical uh, business Google is in, or self-driving cars, are doing, making all the decisions independently to let them make, uh, do it faster. And they build these uh, businesses around smart creatives at all levels. So a CEO was a smart creative, and obviously CEO in the company of, of 100 person, or a sub in a sub-company of 100 person, still has to rely on uh, different smart creatives where he can further empower them to deal with multiple streams of work. So to quote, uh, um, to quote uh, 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 Google founders, when they start the alphabet, Alpha, they said alphabet is about business, uh, businesses prospering through wrong, strong leaders, smart creatives, and independence, full independence, really. Uh, by the way, do you know what's the URL for like the domain name for alphabet? That was interesting. I didn't realize. It's abc.xyz. <laughs> Google especially booked the top domain for that. Interesting. So another takeaway is, uh, uh, is good versus great boss. Over time, I realized and thought, I always thought that uh, good bosses are about delegating stuff. But delegation is about, it's an overhead. Delegation means you have to check, first of all, handle the request and delegate it as, you know, a delegate pattern in uh, software programming, in object-oriented programming, like a proxy, you know. So, uh, in fact, you have to handle the result as well. So it doesn't really scale. Great bosses do more. They build in set environment and then can, instead of uh, manage, they can support people and, empowering the, and empower them fully so that they can act independently. And this is what Google tries to do. Conclusion about smart creative. I don't think that smart creatives uh, are the only one people worth uh, you know, hiring. Actually, uh, it's probably impossible to have just smart creative. All this whole spectrum from an ant worker, you know, uh, maybe you know, an, an engineer just fixing the bugs, maybe like this chief uh, architect, 45 per, per week, uh, probably he's necessary in some place. I wouldn't call him, though, a chief uh, architect. Uh, some uh, people who are standard knowledge workers who uh, maybe work in you know, support organization uh, according to rigid processes, that's okay. There are some smart creatives who are the kernels of the sub-businesses allowing to scale are necessary. So all of them are necessary. However, the, what happens is that uh, we are facing with the growing world and changing environment constantly in an exponential way, uh, a whole uh, force which pu put, puts us to the left. So a person who doesn't do anything, who is today a knowledge worker, tomorrow may be an ant worker. And that's the problem, because uh, you know, uh, what we learned yesterday may be inapplicable in a few years from now if we are not uh, keeping up 
with what's happening and we don't understand the changes, when we don't constantly grow, we are not in the growth mindset and we may wake up being on the very, very far left of this axis. So a few farewell questions to you. So think about it. Are you smart creative or do you want to become one? And do you think you have a great mindset or do you maybe just leverage a great talent you may have, inborn talent? Do you work on your talent? And finally, does your environment support uh, the growth mindset? Thank you. Uh, I think I can take like two questions, but I'm then available in the hall. So we have microphone here. Uh, if anyone wants to ask questions, I'm happy to take them. Otherwise, I will be here packing up.